Hey, Glenn from Inbound Folk here. Today I'm talking to David Sheldon Hicks and Perry Mason at Territory Studio, who specialize in immersive experiences. David and Perry will tell us more about the active sphere concept they worked on with Audi, and they'll walk us through the process of designing human machine interfaces and working on virtual interaction in a functional and physical space. I'm really excited about hearing their take on the future of automotive product design. So let's get started. Thank you very much for joining me. Perry, would you like to give a, a brief little introduction to yourself and the work that you do for Territory Studio? Uh, uh, hi, I'm, I'm Perry Mason. I'm the head of digital at Territory Studio. Um, my world covers things that are interactive, digital in nature. You used to describe my job as things that are on screen, but that doesn't really cut it in territory land. So, um, yeah, because now we're talking about things that are just screenless or spatial so um yeah my my world is kind of evolving uh as part of territory but yeah i've been here a couple of years and uh yeah love everything about it great and i'm david uh founder territory studio we've been going 13 years we started in london um all those years ago well technically we started in a spare bedroom in essex but the bit that we talk about is um <laughs> is is when we when we set up in london and we've got uh other teams across the globe now which is really exciting i always struggle to talk around what connects all of our work together because we're really multifaceted i would say that ultimately we come from design and motion design there's definitely an element of always kind of my, our background actually yeah. we both went to the same university um is graphic design and graphic design for screens but I think there's so much more to that now and not to get, you know, we're kind of pluralistic. There's, lot, there's lots of different aspects to what, what we bring to the work. Yeah, definitely. I think anybody that hasn't heard of Territory Studios in the past will definitely have come into touch with the work that you guys have done. I remember the first time I saw you on the off stage and there was just this wall of like movie posters and games. I was like, okay, I've, I've pretty much seen and watched every single one of those. And I wasn't aware at the breadth of work that you guys already have done in the, I mean, 13 years sounds long, but like it's a, it's a, it's a short space of time, really. Like the amount of work that you guys have squeezed into that time is, is pretty incredible. For anybody that uh, hasn't come across Territory Studios before, like how could you, Give them a brief little introduction to the work that you guys do, like, or what makes you different as a creative studio. So going to how we define ourselves internally, with you know, going through that through our brand lens, um, we talk about world building, you know, being being great world builders. But actually, that means different things to different people. So our niche in film, really early days, was working on screen graphics and holograms. So when you see James Bond hacking into MI5 or Iron Man's heads up display or um, all the holographic user interface work in Ready Player One. That, that would have been us. And it's really started with Ridley Scott's project Prometheus. And we did all the computer screens and, and uh, a lot of the holographics in that film. And it's a wonderful exercise, actually, because it's kind of blue sky thinking. It's kind of imagining the what if and thinking about how do we use designs and the narrative that we tell through technology so you know it might be on a mobile phone or computer display or something bigger what does that say about the characters and the world building in that film so it kind of connects up with a bigger design thinking for the overall look of the movie it connects up with the characters in the film it connects up with the director's vision of the film so it's a really interesting niche i would say in, in movie making but then for us as a studio, it became more broadly relevant to lots of other things. So we realized that um, 
the act of sci-fi, the, um, the act of imagining what if, is very relevant to brands. You know, they want to look ahead and they want to consider where they're going. Um, agencies are often, I would say, connecting up with popular entertainment and kind of queuing into all these different cultural values, which condense down into a design language of, you know, kind of relevant to so many different things. So we're often working with new tech. We're often working with live graphics in some way, whether it's kind of through digital or live experiences. Um, we do a lot of virtual production. We connect up with visual effects. It's really quite varied, but at the heart of it is kind of using that design backbone to kind of explore world building through technology and story, you know, as a platform. Um, and so I think I've kind of consolidated that. I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's an impossible task because it's so broad, but yeah, I think you've narrowed it down really nicely there. I mean, the, 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 the project that I came across recently, which is when, when I reached out to you, was the work that you did for Audi, where you were able to kind of envision their next concept car and how the interface would be in, a, in almost like a, a very minimalist interior and how that digital interface could overlay and augment that vehicle. I mean, that's kind of, the, I, was, I was really interested to hear a little bit more about this. I think they call it the active sphere uh, concept. So Perry, maybe you could tell us a little bit more about what that collaboration la was like with Audi. And, and from my perspective, I'd love to hear like, what's that, what, what kind of brief do you get for, for a project like this? Because it seems like, again, blue sky thinking, but I presume they must, you know, narrow it down a little bit. Yeah, so I, I think it, in, to start more generally, our clients come to us at slightly different points depending on what it is they want us to do. So we can start right at the beginning from a UX and a strategic sort of partnership, or we can kind of join the project a bit further along when it's kind of been decided what needs to be done and we're doing more of a production job. Um, in, in the digital world that we work in, there, there's a lot of crossover between those two things because you we're not just telling a story, we're making something which is functional and has to have, um, yeah, be sympathetic to the needs of the, the physical item or the user. Um, and they essentially get to navigate their own way through uh, an experience like that. So when Audi came to us, they had um, they'd launched three other Sphere cars within that family. Um, a lot of them over lockdown, so they kind of um, didn't get to you know, show the world that much because all of the different events and things were, were not on. So they held this one back. And, and over the course of those other three vehicles, they've been experimenting with what could be done to reduce clutter, I guess, within within the, the cabin. And ultimately, they've got to this last one, which was what happens if we remove all of the screens in, in the car and, and we can put this car in a world where the you know, the use of AR glasses is, you know, it's just what everyone does. Um, so what does that mean for a driving experience? So it's a really interesting brief because um, I think when we first talked about it, we were, in our heads, we kind of put it a little bit before that. You know, we were thinking, oh, is it a heads-up display? Is it a pop-up screen? Is it, are we talking about holograms? But actually, it hit exactly the right time before or, you know, this year, 2023, there's a lot of momentum building around what AR is going to look like. And Audi were very much um, yeah, ahead of the game in, in sort of thinking that far ahead. And yeah, we had a great client who kind of helped us shape what, what the response to that brief would look like. But, you know, a bit, a bit like David's point, trying to put together a team that, um, tell the story in different ways so so our brief was to help create the the film so the the assets for the films are very much like our vfx and screen graphics work um but also make a a functional app so something which could sit in a augmented reality headset and be interactive in the concept car so the, you can imagine the, the type of team but well, as far as I know, we're one of the few studios that would be able to handle something like that. Um, so that's really exciting in itself, but also gives you a lot of, um, I guess, scope to to decide what that is going to look like and how functional it might be, how realistic it is, how tangible it is. 
I think that was the question that most people asked when I mentioned that I was interviewing. It was like, did you actually build the, the, the thing? Like, you know, is it, is it something that you could actually try and test and, and actually experience? That's, that's incredible to hear that you, you managed to do both the, the, the concept piece, like the, 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 the marketing visuals, but also then the, the, real, uh, the real prototype. Yeah, I mean, I think my, my favorite bit of the project, I think, was actually David sitting in the car and putting the headset on and going, oh, wow, like, this is what it's been, <laughs> we've been leading up to this, but it, it kind of just... No, you know, I had complete faith. No, I know. No, not wow about <laughs> so the... Talk, uh, us, talk us through this experience then, David. I'd love, to, I'd love to hear, what was it like sitting in that car so the first time? It, there's always that magic moment when... Um, so, so I relate this to when we're when we're working on films as well. Not to always bring it back to films, but um, when you see, because on a feature film, it's not it's often not visual effects. We're often running live graphics within a within a film set. So when you see um, a computer display or a number of displays running in a in a in an actual physical film set, like let's say the 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 spinner car in Blade Runner, it's really magical. It's really wonderful to kind of see physical design, spatial design coming together with digital and it being really considered. And I think the teams here have been regularly, without thinking about it too much, always collaborating with architects and spatial designers and production designers on where, where digital and physical kind of connect and overlap. And, there, and there's a real mutual respect um, I think there often is between different creative professions. Like you always, the grass is always greener, right? You know, you yeah. see what an architect does or you see what an industrial designer does and you kind of want them to do more of their thing and you kind of pull back and equally they're doing the same thing. They're trying to pull back and let you kind of come forward more. And I think when I sat in the car um, in Germany and Audi, they, you know, they they deserve a lot of credit for being. I was going to say brave. It's probably not brave. It's probably just like visionary, mm-hmm. visionary paired with really kind of wonderfully considered user experience. Like and mm-hmm. and and like having really solid conversations with us around how we realise that. But so there was this real mutual respect in both directions for for what everyone was bringing to the table, and. So their physical design was really considerate of what needed to happen within the digital realm in terms of augmenting and holographics and the experiences that would make sense in a digital space. But and was, so it like the, a, was that a collaborative effort to uh, real, on yeah, that kind of really meshing, There was just, just very good communication around that. Right. And then when we saw the opportunities, we kind of really leaned into digital to kind of, to kind of, maximize those moments really yeah. wasn't it it's like picking your moments knowing when to come forward with the digital and then actually knowing when to celebrate the physical environment mm-hmm. and there's something quite special and i think as creatives we're all going to have a lot more fun with this as augmented reality becomes you know a slimmer form factor and more mainstream you think it's like okay digital is going to take over the world actually it doesn't it it actually it actually puts emphasis back on the physical world because suddenly you can have a digital utility to a very tactile material object. Mm-hmm. So you can have a really plush leather that could be a touch surface yeah. but, and then very minimal graphics that kind of line up with that. So Perry and the team had worked out this wonderful way of almost millimeter perfect, tracking in the, the digital curves and the digital shapes with the physical environment so there's, there's really kind of, and, and we do this in film quite often where, you know, on Blade Runner, you've got Roger Deakins filming this thing. Every single shot looks beautiful. So anything that you augment a graphic into, the, the bar is already set. You know, the, the environment is already wonderfully curated that anything you add to has to be at that level. Otherwise, it won't make it in. And I think there's something to be said for automotive design. They're so, so well informed and understand kind of like the human experience in a contained space that when you come to that as a digital designer and you're playing within uh those boundaries the limitations are already really beautifully set up for yeah. success aren't they yeah. They're just just um so we we learned i think we learned a lot from that as a group kind yeah. of working with them and kind of um 
understanding where the new boundaries lie because it does feel like a new new playground for creatives yeah. it really does harry maybe for those listening to this you could kind of describe that experience for that that david would have would have seen like what what, what how, how would you describe it to somebody who can't see the video it's a good question so um <laughs> so the car i mean like david said it's impressive in itself right so you've got this amazing looking car on a stand that you know you can the doors open automatically and it goes up and down and, and all that's incredible um the bit where we kind of add our layer is, is putting the Magic Leap 2 headset on, getting inside the car, and as soon as you put the headset on, the interesting thing with, with Magic Leap or augmented reality in general, being able to see your surroundings and still be able to get in a car is, is an interesting thing for a start because if you're used to virtual reality, for example, where you're completely removing yourself from something. Or even your phone. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so putting the glasses on just feels like putting glasses on getting in the car, it knows where you are, it's already tracked the surroundings. So as soon as you get into the car, the experience can start. And some of the things that, that we considered and had to kind of build into this and, and work out how to um, present it is, is things like, as soon as you've got a spatial UI, so bits of information around you, highlighting the lines and the curvatures of the cabin, having a welcome animation from Audi. So, all of those things need to be considered because they're in 3D space now. They're in your field of view. They're not just in a 16 by 9 window or 9 by 16 window. <laughs> so thinking about how close the Audi logo is to you, for example, is something which you don't really have to consider until you get to that, that world, right? And so all of those things, um, yeah, start to present themselves in front of you and there is spatial audio, so you can hear things that are around you and you can kind of tell where they're coming from. There are different interactive elements within the car, so parts of the car essentially come to life. So there's a physical dial called the concierge dial, which allows you to change um, what, what we have in the, in the um, experience is be able to change the temperature, so the climate control. Um, and that is just with gestures. So you kind of maneuver your hand towards that dial and it springs into your hand and you can position it where you want and rotate it. There are other interactive elements, um, so like flicking through media, which kind of sits up um, in the, the roof of the cabin. And then other things which were kind of bringing the experience to life. So through the process, we were thinking about how do you build an interface that is all around you, but is not distracting. Mm -hmm. So there are, I guess, three modes within the the experience so you have a mode which is you're completely switched off the car is you know driving its automated mode you can do whatever you want and trust that the car's going to know what it's doing um so that's kind of more your vr experience you know you can switch off from your surroundings and what you're doing um then there is the the sort of standard mode which is where you can position things where you want them and they move out the way when you're not using them so it's kind of because for, for those that need to imagine this, like the actual cockpit of the interior is really minimal in its normal driving mode, right? Exactly. Like you're yeah. just sitting on a comfy seat and it's just got this yeah. big arched interior in front of you with lovely yeah. uh, textures. And then all of the UI basically sort of floats <laughs> in, in this space in front of yeah. you, which looks incredible. Yeah, exactly. And the, I should mention really that in the what we call atmosphere, the the mode where the car's driving itself, the steering wheel tucks away. So actually, you, you're you're just sat in. I don't know. It's like I don't think of a good word to describe it. Like a boat, you know, it's, it's it feels like a like a luxury boat. Really, you you kind of got your legs out, and you can see there's a hole in the front of the. Uh, there's like a glass window where the bumper would be as well. So you can actually see through the front of the car, which is amazing. Oh, wow. um, so it gives you this amazing feeling of space. Yeah, and then on the flip side of, of the automated driving, there is what we want to do is try and make sure that it's, um, yeah, you're, you're making the most of the opportunity for being engaged with the driving experience. So when you put your hands on the steering wheel, so when the steering wheel comes out and you put your hands on it and you're in full-on driving mode, so this is an SUV very much in the, you know, it goes off-road, you know, everything changes like a transformer. But that moment where you put your hands on the steering wheel 
Um, what we imagined is using all of the different sensors that are available around the car to bring that to, to, to your viewing experience. So the terrain on the road, the edges of the road, so using sort of LiDAR data to help you engage with the driving experience and give you it more. It almost makes your vehicle see through it feels like, cause you can, yeah, you can kind of yeah, see the we... terrain more around you without, you know, without seeing through the actual vehicle. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we, we kind of thought, you know, if you're moving forwards, the car scanning where you're going, it knows where you've been. So you can essentially make the car transparent and see what you're going over. So, you're, you know, if you're looking out for potholes or, um, yeah, road markings, whatever, you can you can see you're moving through that space. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's kind of making the invisible visible. Um, which is amazing, right? So. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> I mean, for anybody listening to this that hasn't seen this, you definitely need to go and see the video that Territory Studio uh, um, uh, worked on. It's a it's a an incredible vision of the future because these uh, the 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 goggles or the glasses that you imagine in the in this future concept are just a plain pair of sunglasses, I, I suppose, yeah. and that's kind of where I think a lot of us think we'll get to at some point when the form factor of these devices becomes so small and 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 lightweight that you're you're not even going to think twice about wearing them to to yeah. drive your car it's just going to be a normal a normal thing like you would wear sunglasses any day let's take a quick break because i'd like to tell you more about current the place to see all of your team's work we've all been there it's monday morning and you're back at work after a weekend that felt this a little bit too short you know, last week the team made a ton of progress, but you can't remember which files to look at, which tools to open, which Slack channel that link was shared to. Now imagine your team was using Current. Current integrates with all the tools that your team is already using to let you see all the work in one place and give you and your team better alignment. And at the end of each week, Current's AI powered newsletter automatically summarizes all the work posted and shares it with everyone so that your Monday can start a little less chaotic. Go and visit current.so and transform how you work. The next thing I'd love to ask you about a little bit more from a practical perspective of what does this collaboration between with a with a with a company like Audi look like on a on a regular basis? Like, what's your average day of working with a company like that on on a specific project like this? I mean, is it do you get to see early? Um, I can't remember what they're called. Like, like they're, they're these, these form renders of the, the the concept, or were they much further at that stage already? Like, maybe you could walk us through a little bit about the experience of working with Audi. Yeah. So. We, again, depending on the client and the type of uh, work we're doing, we get to see things in different forms. And I guess given the, the nature of what we do, we, we also spend a lot of time in 3D, you know, so, so we'll get a scale model of the car at whatever stage it's at. We do get access to the, like the back of the car and things to test things out. But quite often, you know, what, especially when you're doing AR and you want everything to be millimeter perfect, and it feels strange even saying millimeter rather than pixel perfect now, but <laughs> mapping everything one to one scale of that vehicle, we got really good at that. And it's amazing. There was, you know, for example, there was one point when we were testing and the tire pressure was slightly down on one of the tires and everything slightly tilted out. And we noticed it before the engineers did. And we were like, I think that tire, oh, yeah, it is. And it's because the, this the what, tr yeah the tracking is so incredible um and back to what you were saying it, it, it's amazing to think that all the things we just described are possible now right so yeah. it, it, it isn't um yes the form factor of the the glasses is going to change but the ability to be able to do a lot of these things is is there at the moment and um yeah it's probably also worth noting that we didn't have access to the headsets <laughs> um immediately because uh, they were still finished making them, you know, so there was no risk involved in that because Magically were kind of on a roadmap and it was going to be launched in, just in time for the project. Yeah. But there was an amount of time where we had to design and test without having full access to the headset, and hmm. which is totally fine because, like you say, you can prototype in CG and we kind of built some of our own internal tools, didn't yeah. we, to kind of view that and... Um, just just to kind of keep moving the design language along, keep moving the experience along, having all those discussions with Audi 
so that kind of final delivery wasn't um, wasn't crunched too much, uh, you know, and that probably something that we've had some experience in just more generally working in the digital space, but also yeah. gaming, mm-hmm. you know, gaming is often that you, you, we often don't have access to the latest PlayStation or Xbox, you know, that still might be in development. Yeah. So you run a simulated environment as to what that will be like. And you have a, a number of, you know, not expectations, but assumptions that you can, and, and kind of boundaries that you kind of work within knowing that there's, you know, best case and a, a worst case in terms of what that what that fidelity might be, and they can be really certain as to what that what that's going to end up like. Yeah, and when the devices were finally delivered, like what was like the biggest revelation when you finally managed to test what you guys had built? Well, we tested them, so we we did have access to test them before they were launched, which was great. Right. Um, so we kind of knew that we were going down the right route and, and where we could, like how far we could push. But I guess the biggest revelation was, you know, when you're wearing them day to day and testing things over and over, um, you, you get to learn a lot about the, the hardware and also the software that's running on them. Um, and we, we work very closely with Magic Leap on, on both of us pushing forward with, with new functionality and how do we get the best thing out of this and what can we do over here? So that was really exciting. Uh, I think the... Yeah, the the biggest learning from them was, well, there's all the practical stuff, like how long is the battery going to last? How much, how much graphic horsepower can we push through the thing? You know, a prescription lens is required. All those kind of little details, because ultimately this, this car now is on a global tour with the app and the headsets and everything kind of as part of the, the uh, ecosystem. So you have to make sure it's going to last for the duration of its its life on tour. Mm-hmm. So it's not yeah. just about a delivery for a one-off event. You know, this is about making something which lives with that uh, physical car. That's a really valid point as well. That um, I guess as graphic designers, you're used to your canvas being locked, yeah. but actually, it's a dynamic environment that you're overlaying design work onto here. So, time of day, lighting, night, course, dust. Yeah. Your backdrop might be a city, might be driving through a forest, that, like all of those kind of accessibility and legibility considerations are kind of rigorously put through like testing, aren't they? Because, yeah. you know, so, it, it, you know, considerations around color and all those sorts of things have, yeah. have um, wider, wider implications for a project, really. Yeah, yeah you never think about all of those minor like like those little details until you're actually testing it and experiencing it and then in those different environments they'll have a big effect how much testing were you able to do then was it then also of internal in like a in a locked bunker somewhere so that nobody could uh like see see the secret project or did they already bring in some people early on just to, to just to do some initial testing well for us um Given that everything we were doing was with a headset on, like no one can see, see anything. So, <laughs> yeah, we, we didn't have um, pretty safe, isn't it? Yeah, we didn't have access to the physical vehicle until right at the end of the project, which is generally the nature of these type of projects. Yeah. Um, so you work on assumptions and test things. You obviously give it to the client so they can test it. Mm-hmm. But yeah, for us, obviously the the sharing or lack of sharing of information between. We, we work with a lot of different um, clients, so we're very careful about where data lives and how it's shared and, and how it's protected. Um, but for, yeah, augmented reality, for example, a lot easier. I can't even imagine what it must be like to gather feedback on a project like this as well, as you're sending sort of versions back and forth to test, like on a, you know, like on a two-dimensional plane, getting feedback is difficult enough at times. Yeah. <laughs> but then in a evolving concept in a three-dimensional space for AR, like how do they, how, how does a client even describe what they might want changed or where there's still a need for adjustment? I I was going to say, well, there's two things really. One is that I think territory really was set up for doing that. We, we know how to make things look good, but also we know how to present them. And if you've got 
senior stakeholders that need to sign something off, we know how to present it in a way that you can understand it in 2D, even if it's a 3D thing. So thinking of the angles or the movement that needs to be um, present to give something a sense of depth, even if they can't put a headset on, and it's probably best presented in the film, like how to tell I was going to say, so you would maybe do like a, a, um, a representation of that experience so they could then view it and say, oh, yeah, yeah like that, exactly. that yeah. looks how we expected it, and then they can yeah, give you okay. feedback. Yeah, and also I think um, I, I think it goes back to that idea, you know, of graphic design meeting spatial design. I think um, the UX team at Audi and the design, you know, more broader design team at Audi, they're leaning into all of their existing language. I think it's actually us meeting them more than, you know, the other way around. Yeah. So they have they have that they have that language for for spatial design. Um, and 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 we are, I would say, as a studio, probably very well versed in taking graphic design into three dimensions mm-hmm. um, and, and making it work over a timeline or, or making it interactive. That's probably yeah. one. You know, you're asking me what what is our unique thing. I think that is definitely a, a, a big part of it. Um, is we've we've been doing that for years and years now, really. Normally in the aid of storytelling, but more increasingly, it has utility, it has a function, it needs to work for multiple users. Um, and, I, and I think there is a growing language for that. I think it will mature. It definitely needs to mature further, but it, it's getting there. It's definitely getting there. I think the other thing I was going to add is just that for AR, um, there is... So, so the client had a, a set of Magic Leap headsets, and we had a set. So we could we could exchange files, and, and you know we met up when we could to kind of talk through what was happening in in the headset. But actually, the the way you interact with something, or where you expect something to be, or how you expect it to function, is actually a lot more straightforward than you'd think because all of the gestures we had in the experience were with your hands, and if you reach for something or move your hand through something you have a sense of what should happen if something's lagging, if you can't quite see it. It makes more sense almost than, I don't know, the, the UX for a website. You know, you don't have to learn anything necessarily. You're kind of feeling your way through and it feels a lot more natural than you'd expect. So a lot of the uh, conversation we had were, were just kind of straightforward. They made a lot of sense. You know, it's like, can that move faster? Oh, let's test it out. And, and you build it in such a way that you can test things quickly and, prototype early and uh, get to answers quickly so yes there's a lot of thought and consideration about where things should live but it did feel quite natural and mm. and i think that as a sort of a topic of like the future of ux it's quite an interesting space because if you throw someone into a headset and they can just use their hands it is a lot quicker to pick up than you think it's not like learning how a mouse works you know and you're kind of connecting yeah, two things good point It'll be interesting to see how Apple's new device sort of once it gets more mainstream, once the once the pro is dropped from the title, like how yeah. how that will be adopted and how my parents might might start using it. Yeah, yeah. I'd love to maybe end on you know you guys are all but all in every single project. It seems always looking to the future of like what might happen, how could this evolve, how how what could this uh, user interface or what this vehicle could look like. Like, what what gets you excited at the moment? Like, when you're looking at the technology that's coming out or what, you know, you're always looking at one step ahead. Like, wh- where are we heading that's getting close to some of those reali- those, those virtual realities that you've created? <laughs> Perry, Perry first? I'll, I'll pick one. <laughs> well, I, I was going to say, I think it's more generally, and I think we both think in a similar way about this, it's the it's the cross pollination of um, either technologies or ideas or presentation of, of ideas that get me most excited. So if you, for example, mixed um, AI and AR, like what what does that look like? Or if you mix, um, yeah, poly, you know, people making lenticular screens for 3D depth within 2D screens, you know, like what does that enable you to do? How do you get to experience things in different ways? So I think it's the, for me, it's the cross pollination of technologies that keep it the most exciting for me. Yeah, yeah. and um, you know, I'm always going to bring it. I'll always bring it back to film or games. I think um, 
and and we saw it definitely with Audi. The the future is often a is often a statement on the now and the past. You know, if we if we think about what we're saying in Blade Runner, it's actually asking a question of where we're headed right now. Really, that's 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 the point. And so, you know, we've done some work with Nike more more recently, and it's kind of on future virtual products, but it leans so much into their heritage. And I think there's really wonderful things with any of these projects. So what I loved about Audi is we didn't have glowing blue holograms. You know, I've just come from a conversation around that. You know, it's like, how do we move away from, um, you know, using blue as a signpost for the, for the future? And I think Audi, well, they did so wonderfully in this project. And I think that anyone going through this exercise is don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. You've got a wonderful design heritage there. There's lots of things to lean into, and they really understood. I feel like they they knew where they were coming from. They felt yeah. confident that they'd got a great design language that now needed to be explored in a new space. And so, don't lose your design thinking when it comes to these things. Like keep keep that there, and just find out how that becomes expressed in a new new use case. Yeah. Um, and you're still trying to fulfil the same human needs that you were when somebody was holding onto the steering wheel and kind of they could smell the they could smell the engine, they could hear the sound of the engine, they could mm. you know, but that it's still an emotive connection with the design of it all. And automotive design, it matters. Like it, it permeates culture. It it has wider I think it has wider significance. It and, and it kind of connects up with music culture and 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 fashion and everything else. There's there's some really wonderful creative cues going on there. So when we're expressing the future, it's not devoid of personality and culture and, and it and it and it shouldn't all be sharp and slick. I think it's it's just finding it's it's finding those the the moments of like paradigm shift and utility that become relevant to to that brand. And I think I think everyone there's some really interesting and exciting things around this at the moment that people are exploring. And it's really good to see you know, not lose people not losing their minds when it comes to future gazing and 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 kind of almost losing the audience. I think some of the some of the brands and the partners that we're working with, they kind of get what's already special about them, and they they kind of they they're holding on to that, but without being held back by the past. And I, I think that's a really it, it, it's an important part of all of all of this. Yeah, great. Maybe, maybe one last practical tip for anybody listening that like you two sort of started in graphic design, what would be like your tip for getting into this industry? Like what would be the, a skill to, to, you know, to try and uh, um, hone or like a, a, an additional perspective that uh, uh, you could provide on, you know, moving more into spatial design? I don't think I've had a traditional trajectory to get here and, and, for me, that's a positive. It's it's a bit like I was saying, you know, that sort of understanding of different disciplines and, and how they might apply to different industries. Um, so I guess my advice would be don't don't focus too much on where it is you want to go. I, I see your career path as a zigzag rather than a straight line. Mm -hmm. So take on things that you find interesting and figure out what it is you like about it and transfer that to the next role and the next role bring something to it and bring something from it um, and just kind of keep building up um, you know, the snowball of, of knowledge and just think outside of your sphere. You know, if you're a designer, look at other, other industries and, and how you can apply that thinking. Yeah, definitely. Definitely other industries. I think, um, you know, we've talked about this a few times, but, you know, I was, I was the same as you. It wasn't, there wasn't really a classic... In fact, motion graphics was still kind of like yeah. coming around. Yeah, yeah it was yeah. kind of still coming out. Um, so, I, I, yeah, I think you've got to be passionate. You've got to be passionate and into whatever you're choosing. And then and I think most creative people are. You're kind of, you're interested in adjacent fields, right? You might be, you know, you'll go off to theatre and be really inspired by something you see there and you'll kind of bring that back to your work or you'll be inspired by a piece of architecture or, or a car design or whatever, in fashion whatever it is, it's all cross relevant to, and the, the, the beauty of what's happening now in the world is not only is it 
you're being inspired by other fields. Actually, those fields are starting to come together and cross collaborate in really interesting ways, like gaming world being relevant to brands and you know um, just just like live experiences and creative tech and just all of these things are just kind of jumbling up in really interesting ways and people are constantly looking for innovation because actually it, it gives creative expression a new muscle to flex and it challenges us to relook at things in interesting ways which I think is what we all need you know creatives don't tend to settle they're, they're pretty rubbish at kind of just doing the same thing and you know everyone wants to hone their craft but we also kind of want to be challenged on the periphery in terms of our comfort zone so i think um you know i, th- I think new tech coming through is a wonderful instigator of that definitely brilliant well david perry thank you very much for your time i really appreciate it been such a fan for such a long time so it's been great talking to you too oh likewise likewise real pleasure thanks for having us thanks very much That's all for now, folks. Thanks very much for sticking around to the end. Remember to subscribe to the Made by Folk podcast if you're watching this. And if you're listening, go and check out the YouTube channel because there you can see a lot more of the work that we're talking about today. I'll be back soon with more inspiring conversations with the people behind design. I'll see you then.